Hello and welcome to Scripture Untangled, a podcast by the Canadian Bible Society. My name is Joanna LaFleur. I'm a friend of the Canadian Bible Society, and I'm going to be your guide for today's episode. In this interview, we're listening to Reverend Dr. Andrew Sterling, who's an ambassador of the Canadian Bible Society. You may have heard him before as he talks to Susan Finley, who is the founder and executive director of Nation at Prayer. And we're talking about how the Bible is a vital part of her life in a dynamic and transforming way, and how God inspired her to start Nation at Prayer. So she talks in this episode about turning to the Bible for wisdom and discernment in her work, praying with parliamentary leaders in government, and how the Bible has helped shine a light in some of the darkest moments of her life. So a little bit more about Susan Finley as she is the founder and executive director of Nation at Prayer, but she says, imagine the impact of in Canada if every elected representative at every level of government in this nation was prayed for every day of the year. Susan is working to see this as a reality, transforming the nation through prayer. And prior to this work. She was a senior consultant in international management, consulting and executive recruiting in corporate work. But then she really felt a calling to do this. And she's going to share her story on this podcast. So please enjoy this episode. And if you know anyone who's working in politics and government, share it with them and share it on social media. are getting ready to interview Sue Finley, the founder of Nation at Prayer. And we're going to look at her life and the role of the background of faith and how it informed her early days. We're going to look at and explore what it means to be praying for politicians and navigating the sometimes uncertain waters of the political sphere. And we're going to get an insight into her own faith and the role of the Bible in the life of Sue Finley. We look forward to this discussion, and we hope you do too. Susan, I'm so delighted to have you with us at the Canadian Bible Society, and to have and to hear from you your own personal story and the place of the Bible in your own life. And I thank you for coming and being with us as our guest today. Oh, Andrew, it's such a privilege and a joy for me to be here and in the Bible Society. The Bible has played such a fundamental part in my life and still does in a transformational and a dynamic way. And of course, to have the opportunity to spend time with you to talk about faith, life, leadership, and all that the Lord continues to do. So I'm delighted to be here. That's wonderful. Susan, tell us a little bit about your background and your background in the faith and your family. Mm -hmm. And at what point did you really come to an appreciation of the importance of the Bible in your own life? Well, you know, I like to think of it that I was blessed with a richness of heritage in the faith a richness of opportunity through the which the Lord led in many, many ways, of course, and a richness of challenge and life experience. The Lord can use all of those in a powerful way. But the Bible for me has been such a pivotal and uh, dynamic force, which I'll talk about a little later as we get into Nation at Prayer. Uh, But above all, a personal relationship with the Lord. So, my mom was a, an, a very accomplished public health nurse, person of deep faith, very practical, very dynamic in the faith. Always would talk about trust the Lord and keep your bowels clean. So that was, the, <laughs> that was my mother's practical approach to life. My dad was a great combination. He was a biblical scholar, pastor. He um, combined in a unique way what it is to have conviction, grace, great sense of humor, and be engaging. Both of those were just so influential in my life and created an environment where it was always focused on I was God's child and focused on developing a a personal relationship with him. It wasn't an environment of control and um, prescribing 
but environment that really nurtured an individual faith. It, it almost sounds uh, unrealistic, but it was the way it was. My grandfather and my great-grandfather homesteaded from Sweden and pioneered um, and really homesteaded in Mydale, Saskatchewan. Uh, my great-grandfather was a person of just very profound prayer. It was said of him that when he prayed, you believe the Lord was right across the table. My grandfather was a Bible teacher, a lay pastor. He became mayor or reeve of the community, always had a sense of engagement with the community, with um, impacting the community for good, all of this while he was farming. So there, there was a richness in that background that played certainly a significant role in what became Nation at Prayer later on. My great, my grandmother on my maternal side, she, she and I would always talk about the faith. She died when I was 12, but I still recall great, great lessons in the faith. So it was a rich uh, environment that really nurtured both a sense of service to community, a sense of engagement, with what was going on in the world, and most importantly, a personal relationship with the Lord. I gave my heart and soul to the Lord when I was eight years old after a Billy Graham movie. And I was in the back of the church, always an independent person. I was sitting in the back of the church at the evening service. And this movie was shown. And I, I can still recall so much about it. Jesus Keep Me Near the Hook Cross was playing. And I always teased my dad that I didn't have an opportunity to go forth. There wasn't any kind of response given. Into we'll talk about that okay. in a moment. <laughs> what I'm interested in though too, Sue, is that you know your father was a biblical scholar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things in your life were sort of rooted in, in the scriptures really um, because not only of the, the pastoral and the religious background of your family, but in terms of your own reading of the Bible, because there comes another point in your life where that sort of moved away. But first of all, just go back again to sort of your own appreciation mm -hmm. through your development as a young person with the Bible itself, your sort of engagement with the Word. You know, my father was one where the Word dwelt richly in him, as Paul says to the Colossians, and he really modeled that. He loved getting a variety of translations and really studying the Bible. And so when I was in, when I was in kindergarten, the Thanksgiving, and I have the Bible uh, with me, uh, the Thanksgiving after I was five years old in kindergarten, I was given a Bible with the inscription to our Susan from Daddy and Mummy, and it was a King James Bible, and I loved that Bible. I think one of the lessons is that we underestimate children's ability to comprehend. A lot of it I didn't understand, but I poured over that Bible so much so that it had to be refinished. And then at, at strategic points of my life, um, when I went off to, I went to the Baptist Leadership Training School. It was a leadership development program, not intended to go into the ministry, but intended to deepen your faith for engagement in whatever profession. Some people did go into the formal ministry, but uh, for me it was such an important one. And being an independent thinker, I had announced to my parents that that's what I was choosing to do. I graduated young from high school. And that year was pivotal because it provided a grounding in the Word and yet independent thought to really prepare prepare me and prepare all of us there for thinking through life and engagement in community or whatever profession from a biblical point of view. And for me, the Bible really became um, a governor, foundational, and I have, I've always loved the Word because for me it's the living Word. You did write, though, in a book that was published in 2019. Mm -hmm. You wrote a chapter about your life. Yes. Um, and in it, you shared a personal struggle of how the Lord drew you to the Bible for inspiration. And you wrote these words, so I'm reminding you of something yes, yeah. you've already written. But I found it a fascinating phrase. You said, at that time, I was not in the practice or discipline of the daily Bible reading. 
and unthinkable to me now. I had not even brought my Bible to the hospital. You were in hospital. Opening it, I immediately became aware that when you're not spending time in the Word, you don't know where to turn at a particular time of need. As the Lord would have it, the Bible fell open at Philippians 4. There could not have been a more pertinent passage for that moment, and it's the one that begins, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. The Lord is near, etc. This is a fascinating comment that you make. So clearly there was some point where you had a need and your reigniting of your love and passion and need for the word became very important. Tell us a little bit about that, Sue, because I think there are people who honestly might have even grown up with the word, might have had it imbued within them at an early age, but through various issues in their lives, drift away from the reading of it, and yet here clearly when you come back to it, it has a decisive impact. I'm so glad you pointed that out and raised that, that uh, illustration from the Bible because that was such a significant moment for me. You can love the Word, you can love it, but not be in the daily practice. Life can take over. At that time, I was uh, going through significant health challenges. For about two years, I had four surgeries in two years. And uh, cancer was advancing. And uh, just when I think about it, I was in a senior executive role at that time, working 24-7, and life can get in the way of our daily devotions, which is interesting because people we engage with now, it's one of their biggest challenges. And with that particular time, that surgery was a significant one. It was a hysterectomy, a complete hysterectomy. I was 28 years old at the time and had been so ill. And so that, that experience alone led to many facets of, of the depth of faith, not the least of which was returning to reading the Bible. And I had been through the day before I uh, nearly died, actually. And um, when I woke up the next day after going through just a horrific experience and, and, uh, and quite a deep experience with the Lord in a whole other dimension, I woke up in this private room and the first thing I wanted to do was read the Bible. And bless the Gideons, I reached over to the table beside and I pulled out and there was a, a Gideon Bible. And I realized that when you aren't in the practice of regular Bible reading, and of course I had been to a sort of Bible school, although it was a leadership development school, as grounded in the word as many people would be, I realized that when you aren't in the practice of regular reading of the word, you do not know where to turn when you want certain passages or want to, to get a certain promise from the Lord or where to turn in a time of crisis. And that was really a wake-up call for me. And it's amazing how the Bible just opened. I, Philippians, Philippians 4. 4. I you mean, could of all not passages, find a better right? passage. No, you couldn't. No. Be no. anxious for nothing. Yeah. But in everything through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, yeah. and the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. Yeah. And then it goes on I can do all things through Christ who strengthens yes. me. And that was so powerful and completely shifted. And I also learned, because of the experience I had had the day before, that when you pass on, because I was, as they told me, I was pretty much near death, and it would have been fine. I was so, when you pass on in the Lord, there is nothing to fear. And when you do not fear death, you don't fear life. You know, it's just, it's the maxim that, it is transformative. And so that was a transformative. Now, was I in the same, after that experience, was I in the same discipline that I'm in now of reading the Bible? Not the same, but I was reading it regularly. It's just the Lord led me to a whole different, uh, different approach. And that happened the night that my dad passed on. And I was really close to both mom and dad. 
and they were so influential. But my mom had passed away two years earlier. And then my dad, who at the time was, pa he passed, uh, took, it was preaching the day he took a heart attack. And then he passed away the following week. And he had been given, by the time he, this happened, he was doing different interim uh, pastorates. And he'd been given a gift of money from a church he had been uh, doing interim work at, a little gift of money. And he went out and bought this Bible mm -hmm. and the NIV, which was new at the time. Now, that was in 1988, so it was relatively new. And we were with him at the Toronto General Hospital in the cardiac care unit. There were my two brothers and Mel and me gathered around the bed. Dad had taken the heart attack a week earlier. We knew his time was limited and that he would likely be passing on that night. So we were with him when his soul went to be with the Lord. And if ever there is a compelling moment, sad, yes, losing one that you love who's been influential in your life, but more powerful to see the spirit as the spirit leaves the body and the difference you know the spirit is alive, but the body has failed. And beside his bed, now this is midnight on the Saturday night, and on the Sunday night, and beside his bed was this Bible that was, he had bought it six months earlier, but there's still jam in Colossians where he would be preparing for <laughs> sermons on a Sunday morning. And my brother said, Susan, you really should have the Bible because we know that you so and appreciate the word. And it was that night driving up the Dawn Valley Parkway. Now it's now about midnight. And I'm holding the Bible and, and going through all the emotions that you, a person goes through during that time. And I committed to the Lord silently to do two things. The first thing was to spend the first hour of every day with him. Now that my earthly father had gone to be with him, I was going to spend that first hour with my heavenly father, my eternal father. And the second was to read his word through, cover to cover, every year, which I have done since. Now, at that time, we were in the midst of turning the organization around that I was working with. So you don't come in an hour later and say, well, sorry, folks. I was praying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was praying. <laughs> and you'll come second. Because we need uh, to model. I've always uh, known you work is unto the Lord. Right. And so you get up an hour earlier. Right. And, um, and that became pivotal. Because I decided, and I, I say to folks, this isn't the normal way you should do it. There's many wonderful ways, and certainly folks that I mentor, I, I encourage them first to get to know Jesus. But the, I start in Genesis in January and go right through to uh, Revelation through the year. It was, that was in 1988. In 2003, so fast forward 15 years, and I was loving, I was getting to know, I was, oh, the word would speak different days for different things and in a powerful way. But I was just doing it, not for any purpose other than to, because of my commitment to the Lord and get to know him and experience the living word in a different way. Which brings me to a very major issue in your life, which you said is 2003. And you transitioned from a career in human resources and management consulting and the things that you had yes. to go in and work the, those long hours for, but to the creation of, of Nation of Prayer. Tell us something about Nation of Prayer, its ministry, and the role of the Bible, I think, really, in, mm -hmm. in deciding that that was your calling. You make particular reference, I think, to Second Chronicles and that wonderful text that inspired you to sort of be an innovative and, and, and prayerful mm -hmm. presence among those who are political leaders. Tell us a little bit more then about mm -hmm. how your reading of the Bible influenced you to create mm -hmm. Nation and Prayer. April 26th, 2003. At this point, I'm in executive search and I knew the Lord had been calling to something different. But in my journey through the Bible, I'm now into 2 Chronicles 6. We'll often think of 2 Chronicles 7, if my people who are called by my name. This was reading 2 Chronicles 6. 
where Solomon, the king, has just been anointed king. And he, and of course, David had set the stage, but Solomon as the king was standing on the dais and Israel was bowed around, the leaders were all bowed around, as well they say, the, the implied is the leaders, but Israel's bowed around. And Solomon then bows down and he offers up the nation to the Lord and he says, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, you who keep your covenant of love with your servants who follow wholeheartedly in your way. And you go forward a few verses and then it says, the glory of the Lord so filled the temple that even the priests couldn't enter it. And I looked up, now you have to appreciate, the Lord always, always speaks to me through his word and in a different and dynamic way. I haven't been subject to visions. The Lord speaks to some people in visions, but certainly hadn't to me in that way. And this is a Saturday morning at 6.30 in the morning. Mel has gone off to a, a men's breakfast at the church. And I'm reading this and I looked up and the Lord gave the vision that led to Nation of Prayer. And the vision was of elected representatives standing on Parliament Hill, elected representatives at every level, federal, provincial, municipal, standing on Parliament Hill, holding up the nation to the Lord. And then I could see Christians across the country holding up every elected representative because we know from scripture, the Lord can use Nebuchadnezzar, he can use Cyrus, my servant Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus my servant Persian, Cyrus, yes, right. and on and on. Mm -hmm. So I could see that and as people were lifting elected representatives at every level in prayer, I could see the power of the Holy Spirit being poured into the hearts and minds of those who govern the nation. And the Lord was absolutely clear, it was not about parties and it was not about issues. Now, it's interesting because in 2003, there, was, there were many, many issues going on in the country. The big one at that time was around same-sex marriage. And a lot of uh, Christians were getting involved and lobbying for different positions on that. There were issues around questionable judgments that, ju that justices or Supreme Court justices were making. There was just a lot of noise, if you want that word, in, in the country. We had worked at senior levels of government, Mel at very senior levels of government. We knew all about those things, but the Lord was so clear what was needed was a presence that could relate to individual elected representatives as a source of encouragement in terms of faith development, as a source of refresh refreshment and reflection on navigating the challenging role of what it is to be a person of faith in, uh, as you navigate all the complexities of government. So that was the genesis of Nation at Prayer. And the Lord did not say, go start an organization. I think at that point, I'd been there, done that with many organizations at the senior level. We know organizationally that form follows function. He laid out the vision. And then what the framework of it was is one-on-one -on -one, and still is one-on-one -on -one with elected representatives at every level including Indigenous. We have a very uh, strong and, and engaged ministry with Canadian Bible Society to uh, elected representatives and to Indigenous communities. Secondly, is to engage the Christian community to pray for all politicians. Third, is to spark prayer breakfasts. Not that we do them. We do have a book on how to do them. And I happened in my past, as one of the many experiences, to uh, be chair at one point of the Toronto Prayer, co-chair of the Toronto Prayer Breakfast and the Markham Prayer Breakfast. And, and so had that lens. But really to spark them, because we know in scripture that when Christians gather beyond barriers of denomination and that, the Holy Spirit has a powerful venue. And then the fourth pillar is, pillar is to resource and equip, and we send out guides on how to pray when you're not praying about issues. But we say to people, it is okay to pray about issues, but our role is very much to be that individual 
non-issue focused presence in the life of individual elected representatives. Well, Sue, that's one of the things that I've admired most about what you and Mel have done on the Hill. As you know, I ministered in Ottawa for many years yes. uh, before moving uh, to Toronto. And right there in, in Ottawa, those some of those were the early days of Nation of Prayer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the sense that you were able to minister to people as people, as persons, not just as politicians, that you were an integral part of their lives in many ways and that you heard things and saw things and prayed for things that sort of transcended the political arena but were also having an impact on the lives of those individuals who were in the political arena but the way that you have maintained your sort of your independence and you've maintained your sense of being trusted um, and that you keep confidences is, is so very important. There are, in the Bible, Sue, there are, Jesus talks about prayer in, in sort of two different ways. He talks about it in the very private, intimate way. Close the door and go into your, your closet, go into your room and quietly pray to the Lord. And that's from Matthew. And, but then there's also the public, the Our Father which art in heaven, that sense that it's ours. Mm -hmm. It's, it's joint. It's, it's, it's a group. It's a people who pray from the Gospel of Luke. How does Nation of Prayer balance sort of prayer as a public act, and do you do that much, or is it mainly prayer as a private, personal act? Predominantly, I would say, because the focus is one-on-one, -on -one, it's very much a personal, and you can appreciate in those, because of the uh, nature of the political role, we, we are, um, we're, we really engage with politicians around some very personal family issues. Politics is such a challenging role. So the, there, that's a very uh, personal time in which a lot of our role is really asking the right questions, praying that the Lord will help us to know what it, because it's the questions. And if you ever want to see a model of questioning, of course, it's Jesus himself. He's a, he, his questions are always so brilliant and perfect. So we pray for that. Questions that will help them unlock, because we can walk into one office of a person who's with one party in one moment. An hour later, we're with a person with a different party. There's such freedom when you don't see people in terms of party or issue. But of course, they're all, each of them are about issues and wrestling things through. But in addition to that, there's the personal side. So yes, much of our time, you know, are behind closed doors in a very meaningful way. The degree to which we don't organize large gatherings at all, the degree to which we would be engaged in public ones would be around prayer breakfasts. And we even have a booklet on how to do an effective prayer breakfast. In the past year, the Lord has so extended the role of nation at prayer. I mean, we've, he's been extending it globally, interestingly, but also uh, Mel, who's co-executive director now with me uh, since 2008, actually, and that's a whole separate story, which you would have to ask him his journey with that. But um, he, in the last year, Mel was asked to be the liaison to replace the person who retired as liaison to the weekly parliamentary prayer breakfast. Right. And so in that sense, there are a number of par parliamentarians, senators, elected representatives that gather every Wednesday morning. So Mel will be gathering again tomorrow with them for a personal time of prayer and support. And uh, they, they park their, their hats at the door and the chair is always an MP that, or it could be a senator, I suppose, but it's been an MP in the last few years, as an extension of that role. So that is, again, where two or three are gathered. The collective. More the collective. Yes, yes. And then as yes. an extension of that role, Mel is also liaison now to the planning of the National Prayer Breakfast. He's also liaison to the Washington. The, the, he's really the point person for those who will be going to the Washington prayer breakfast, which happened just a month ago. Early, well, early February, so more than a month ago. So in that sense, the Lord has extended our involvement. But 
many of the, um, we aren't as engaged with organizing groups. We would be more of a catalyst to the spirit using and as a springboard with other groups, what is happening in collective around prayer. But our focus is always around one-on-one -on -one with elected representatives and, one -on and then being a catalyst for the spirit. And we always say our role is to be an instrument for the spirit in the lives of politicians and parliamentarians and in the life of the nation. Pausing the conversation with Susan to tell you about the Bible course, because whether you're a seasoned Bible reader or you're just starting on your journey, the Bible course offers a superb overview of the world's best selling book. This is an eight session course and it will help you grow in your understanding of the Bible. It uses a unique storyline and the Bible course shows you how key events, books and characters all fit together. It's great for in-person groups or you can use it in digital gatherings. It really can be used anywhere. Watch the first session for free and review the accompanying course guide. Go to biblecourse.ca to learn more, biblecourse.ca. And of course the link will be in the show notes. Now back to the conversation with Susan Finley. It's a great gift. I mean, it's mm. a great gift. I mean, I know from anecdotal evidence, those that have gone to the weekly prayer gatherings and how much it has meant to them. So putting on a different hat now mm. for a moment, because you have many. Um, yes. And uh, there are two things I'm really interested to hear from you. The first is that you have been a, a board member, a governor at Tyndale, mm -hmm. um, that you are, as you said at the beginning, someone who was trained as a teacher. We at the Bible Society are concerned um, and have a great passion for next generations, those that are to follow us. And the life of young people as it's emerging in what seems to be a rather challenging and difficult time. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you engage with and think about young people um, and young people in our society. And do you think that the Bible can have or does have any real relevance in their lives? You know, we've been talking lately about fresh winds of the Spirit. Young people are so dear to our heart. We are both mentoring right now two in their teens. Now, how do you figure that at our state? There is such a hunger. We, uh, we've been mentors with Aero Leadership, of course. We're both mentoring, I would say, probably six or seven people. But it's young people that are so dear, you know, that I may proclaim your power to the next generation, says uh, the word. We also lead workshops in mentoring on we are all mentors to young people. There is a hunger right now for authentic, a faith of authenticity and realism that's in touch with the world but grounded deeply in faith. I got to tell you about last month at Mission Fest in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, held at a huge church, Church of the Rock is the setting, and our display the Nation at Prayer display is always in the, the large, large sanctuary, which is a wonderful location for it. And on the Friday night was the youth night. Now, not only were all the seats filled, I don't know how many it seats, but it's certainly in the hundreds and hundreds. And then seating room on the floor was jam-packed, all with youth. I look over, I'm, we're watching the, uh, the program and, and attentively, and I look over and on our table, the only room left, are seven young people sitting just wrapped in attention by what the speaker at that time was talking about, how the spirit is moving around the world. What we are seeing now, that's only one example. Another person just said to me the other day, are you noticing how many young people just love prayer? And we're seeing, um, like an awakening, we have to think of Asbury and the recent awakening at Asbury University. And that started spreading. I mean, that was university age. But we're seeing a move of the spirit at, at a time when people are saying, isn't it awful? People are turning away. 
Well, we know the Spirit often works in ways you would never expect, in unprecedented ways. And we think this is one of the most hopeful times for youth, but it is calling those of us who often put up barriers before they exist, thinking, well, who'd be interested? It's time for those of us to think about what it is to finish well. And I think you start finishing well in your 20s when you think, what's the impact I want to have? And finishing well is thinking about how can I be a, fa a valuable resource in whatever way. It may not be even in a formal getting together for coffee, but it's all about being vibrant in our faith. You know, just the other day I was reading about Caleb taking the high ground. We know that Caleb was one of the 12 in, well, in numbers, when the spies went into the land and then all of Israel comes back. And then 10 out of the 12 are saying we can't do it. And because they didn't trust the Lord, they're wandering 40 more years in the wilderness. I had never realized till this past Saturday, reading again, when Joshua had divided up the land, and Caleb then said, he's 85 now, 85 years old. And he says, I want to take the high ground. The very people, the Anakites, that had deterred and so frightened the Israelites way back when they, the spies were initially sent in, in one little verse it says, Caleb defeated three Anakites at 85. And you know what struck me? What struck me wasn't just, that's amazing at 85, but that he doesn't, it's not recorded that he's looking back bemoaning all those years and then regretting and saying, why did we do that? He's still looking ahead. And for us to be engaged, nothing so engages young people, like people that are vibrant in their faith. We have some great discussions with an 18-year-old around what's it like to be an 18-year-old right now. Tell me some of the challenges. What are you seeing in your schools? And we have another, a nephew actually, who's now 19, who will come in and say, can I do devotions with you in the morning? Mel and I'll be doing, and he gets up sort of three hours later or whatever. <laughs> and he loves the questions. And if we are open to really being interested in young people who are desperately searching for a relationship, to have models of people who are open to questions and open to new learnings, but, but at the same time really grounded in faith, well, I just think it's a wonderful time, but it's also a hopeful time. It is, and, and, and I think that there are times in which those of us who are an integral part of the Christian community have an overly negative view mm. of the next generation. I mean, it's almost endemic. I mean, it's almost part of us, you know. Well, I mean, the way we used to do it was X, but they're doing it Y. And, you know, well, really, they're not quite where they should be. Or you look at the challenges and the problems they have. Mm. One of the things we've noticed even at the Bible Society is that young people are quite eager to engage in the stories of the Bible. Bible, yes. that they're quite interested and want to know more about the person of Jesus again. And maybe a generation that has lapsed a little bit or has not been formed in quite the same formal way in the faith, they're coming back and they're asking again, who is this Jesus mm -hmm. and what does he have to say to us and what is his relevance in our lives? And the stories of Jesus and the life of Jesus is having a positive impact. And so the Bible sort of lives in engaging people with the person of Jesus himself and, and finding in him the source of, of life and hope that they're looking for. On another note. Well, just on that, yeah. mm. when I'm talking to young people, I will say, get to know Jesus. Look at how he engages. And it's not about the trappings of church. You know, Jesus did die for the church, but he died individually for us. Get to know him because there can be so many layers of, uh, and filters that disengage people. Uh, and so, you know, I think just on your point, start with the gospels, just get to know Jesus. 
And I think this is a day and age when it's like the early church. When you think many people have, are not as grounded or may not have grown up in that, it's a real opportunity. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I know, it's a great point. Sue, there are many issues facing our world at the moment. Um, that some of them are deeply troubling and worrying. Wars and rumors of wars we know about. Um, environmental crisis, um, social problems, economic issues. Politicians that you minister to are having to deal with all of these things. Without sort of dwelling on a particular topic itself, um, but in a general sense, what should we be praying for these days? I mean, what should be at the heart of our prayers for the world that we're in and those who are seeking to provide meaningful leadership within it? The best thing, if you ask any politician, and that's how we developed our first resource material, what do you need prayer for mm -hmm. specifically? Wisdom and discernment is always the top of the list because when you think about it, if they need whatever the issues are, and every one of them are dealing with significant issues, every politician we relate to is, but what they want, politicians of faith, is the wisdom of the Lord. The complexity of pol politics at any time, there's competing agendas, competing priorities, and and plus their, their own schedules go from like seven in the morning till, and you know, could be 10 at night. So the refreshing power of the Holy Spirit to refresh their hearts and minds. Let me give you one example. We walked into, this is a few years back, but to a politician of very deep faith. And when we sat down, it was about 7.30 in the morning, and we said, how are you doing? Because he was leading a very challenging bill through the house at the time. How are you doing? And he said, I'm so tired, I can't think straight. And plus, his, I think his house had burned down. I mean, it was just like reading something out of a... Out of a Job, Oh, maybe. <laughs> everything had gone. Oh. And so we, we listened to all that, we asked him questions, and then we had prayer. We offered it all up to the Lord. And when you are in the intimacy of an office, office, praying that the Holy Spirit will fill that politician with everything he or she may need for, to meet what they're about for the Lord's purposes, that's a powerful experience, mm -hmm. and to leave that with the Lord. We stood up and he said, I'm so refreshed. I can think clearly now. And I said, remember where it says in Romans, conform no longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you can test and approve what God's will is. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. You know, we just had, an, about a month ago, I have to share this with you, it was so dramatic. A politician we've known for quite a while and we had booked time with him at the end of the day. And then we got a call from the office, because, you know, pivoting is our byword on the, on the hill, of course. And schedules change very quickly. And we got a call at about quarter to 12 and from the office saying, he really wants to see you. And instead of four, because he'd had some kind of media call or something, uh, could you have a quick lunch, half hour lunch? We said, oh, sure. So we raced over to the to the uh, cafeteria where we were meeting. And, you know, it was a catch up and how are you doing? And we've known this person quite a while, how's it going? And as he's standing up, I couldn't believe I was even asking this because there was no time for him to respond. As he's standing up, I said, how's your private member's bill going? Not that we have an opinion on the bill, but he looks, he says, that's why I am right now leaving to go to um, a meeting where I'm very concerned that some in the meeting are going to take the heart out of that bill. His, his private member's bills are always substantive. And we said, well, you know, we're not gonna pray about the bill, but we will right now pray that the Holy Spirit clears the hearts and minds of those in that meeting that will give them clarity of thought that God's purposes will be served. To do the right so thing. So yes. this is being said yes. as he, he said, oh, I know, and he yeah. races off. Yeah. So Mel texts him that night and says, how did it go? And he just sends it back saying, it was like a Damascus Road experience and the bill's going through. 
So the next day we ran into him. He said, I'm now going to send you my everything I'm doing every day <laughs> for you to pray about. Just tongue in cheek that way. So how but what a powerful example. Powerful example. Finally, Susan, I mean, the one gift that we always want to offer our guests is our prayers. And those who listen and those who watch this want to pray for the things that matter to you. And so what can we, those who are listening, those who are watching, myself, our team, what can we do to lift you up in prayer? And what should we be praying for? We talk about keeping step with the Spirit and walking in wisdom. And the best thing that, or the thing we would treasure most is prayer that we would keep step with the Spirit, that the Lord would go ahead and continue, as he's done for 20 years now, continue to extend the reach of Nation at Prayer, it's his ministry, and continue to give us the wisdom and the discernment to know which opportunities are his, to keep us focused, to keep us free of any distraction from what he would have us do. And then, of course, for protection in travel, that he, the, the Holy Spirit as well would go ahead and be working in the hearts and minds of those we're going to meet with every day. That's the very best thing, and that we would always be in touch with the Lord and that his word would live powerfully through us. On that wonderful and inspiring note, you have our assurance that you will receive such mm -hmm. prayers. And I want to thank you, Susan, for not only your time, but your passion, your clarity, mm -hmm. your willingness to talk about yourself, but also, of course, about Nation of Prayer. And be assured of our prayers for you and our gratitude to you. And it's just been lovely spending this time together. God bless you. Oh, thank you so much, Andrew. What a gift and what an opportunity. And may God bless you and the Canadian Bible Society. I hope you have enjoyed the conversation that we've had with Sue Finley of Nation at Prayer as much as I have. You, of course, will be taken by her enthusiasm, her love for the faith, her passion for the Bible, and how she navigates the difficult waters of political life and praying for those in leadership. We want to thank Sue for being with us as we get a glimpse of the place of the Bible and it's alive even on Parliament Hill.